And the church said, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you quickly turn to Romans chapter number 12? Quickly turn to Romans chapter number 12. And I I just want to jump right in. I know the kids are in service today. This is the last Sunday of the month. So uh, if you have a kid with you or your your son or your daughter with you, uh, if they don't have a a kid's pack, we have those in the back and one of our ushers can give those to you if you uh, need those. But Romans chapter number 12, we're continuing our series called The Road to Recovery And we're taking the letters um, in the word recovery and every week we're unwrapping and we're unpacking um, this idea that we all come in with some type of hurts. We all come in with some type of uh, hang up. We all have some type of baggage that we're dealing with some and, and they're all different. You know, mine is different than yours and yours is different than mine. But if we're honest with ourselves, we all struggle with something. Amen. Could you say that honestly, that we all are struggling with something? That's why we need each other. And, and we talked um, just the, over the last uh, four weeks, today's the fifth week, the R is the reality step. We understand and we come to this reality and we realize that we're not God, that we cannot control anything of our own and anything in this life that we need God and we need Jesus. And then the next, uh, 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 the E stands for that we earnestly believe that God exists. This is that we have hope. Okay, we have hope, not in ourselves, but we have hope in this God that we serve. We have hope, listen to me, that God exists, number one. We have hope that I matter to God, and we have hope that you matter to God. And and finally, we have hope that God has the power to help you and I recover. The third week, the the C is the commitment step. We basically said, God, I'm going to make a commitment to cross that aisle, and I'm going to make a commitment to recover from myself and my sins and my selfishness. And then last week, we we dealt with this idea that the fourth step is the house cleaning step, and we made a moral inventory. We openly confessed, that's the O, we openly confessed our, our, our defects and our struggles. Well, this week, today, the fifth step, the V, is known as the, the, re, the transformation step, and here's the V this morning, that we voluntarily, because can, can, can I tell you something? God is not going to make you do it. God's not going to make you do anything. He wants you and I to come to him and say, God, I, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm grasping, and there's nothing hardly left but a thread. And I'm going to voluntarily submit my life and voluntarily submit myself over to your care. And listen, voluntarily submit to every change that God wants to make in my life. And then I'm going to ask him to remove my character defects. If we're honest with ourselves, we all have character defects. There's some of us that are selfish. There's some of us that are control freaks. There's some of us that are opinionated. There's some of us that are shy. There's there's, there's just some of us that struggle and there's things in our character that don't allow us to be the person that God has called us to be. Are you with me? Are you tracking with me? Amen, church? And this is this transformation step. And can I tell you why this is important? Because God is more concerned that you're transformed than how much you know. God doesn't care about your knowledge. Now, hopefully we grow more and more into the image of Christ and we gain a little bit more knowledge, but we can read all the books that we want. We can know all the Hebrew. We can know all the Greek. But if we don't let the word of God change us and transform us, then what are we doing here? God has called us to be transformed. Scripture, Romans chapter number 12, and I want to read verse 1 and 2. And I want to set this as our context. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And I love the translation that says, which is your spiritual act of worship. Here's the problem with that. Here's a problem as verse 1 in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Can I tell you what the problem with a living sacrifice is? Because when we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, sometimes when we get on the altar and sometimes when God, the fires of change and the fires of challenge come at us, you know what we want to do as a living sacrifice? We want to jump off the altar. That's the problem. We said, oh God, I can't stand this. I I, I can't trust you. I can't have faith in you. So let me go and do my own thing again. But this is what it says. This, my friends, is how you can be a living sacrifice. According to verse 1. Verse 2. 
And do not be conformed to this world. But here's, here it is. But be what? Say it with me. Transformed. Say that, say that word. But be what? Trans, there you go. Be transformed. How? By renewing your mind. I, I like the one translation that says, let God change the way that you think. And see, here's the thing about recovery. When we are recovering from hurts, habits, addictions, hang up, people that hurt us and people that haven't forgiven us or people that we haven't forgiven, when we're struggling with all these hurts and pains, the change has to begin in the mind. Notice what he said. Notice what Paul doesn't say. He he doesn't say renew your heart. Because before you renew your heart, you have to have a change in your mind. You have to have a change up here in your mental, in your emotional. It has to be here first. And then it travels 12 inches down to here. The average person's heart from their head is 12 inches. Friends, in order to get here, it's got to start here. Because if we don't get it here, then we continue to... It's kind of the old situation. You you know, in, in a lot of the shows... That, that, that were really good, wholesome shows back, back in the day. I grew up watching a show called Bewitched. Anybody ever see that show? And, and there's a character, and I can't remember the character in the show. And I remember it was the old black and white episodes. And this is when I even had color. It's still black and white. I'm like, Daddy, we out of color television. Why is it still in black and white? I'm like, duh, makes sense. He's like, they haven't colorized it yet. I'm like, what does that mean? But there was a character. That whenever they made that decision, and maybe you can tell me after service what that character's name is if, if you watch that show. But he'd have what? A good person on his shoulder. And then he'd have a bad person on his shoulder. And he'd go back and forth, back and forth. Oh, no, you should do this. Oh, no, you shouldn't do this. Yes, you should. No, you shouldn't. And he's battling here. You, you, you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember what I'm talking about? And here, here's how it is in our life. That we have this thing called our conscience. And the battle's between our ears. Are you with me? Because we want to do good and and we want to make positive changes and we want to live good in our lives and we want to make good decisions and all that stuff. But then there's this voice, this inner voice that says, no, you can be your own person. And no, you don't have to trust in Jesus. And no, you, you just come to God and you get saved and then you can live life however you want. And as long as you punch your ticket, as long as you're a good Christian, as long as you come to church one time a month, as, as long as you give tithes, as, as long as you serve, and as long as you do all this other stuff, you're going to be a great person and you're going to be a, a, a good, uh, 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 positive mark on society. But that's not what God says. God says be transformed. Change the way that you think. But here's the problem this morning. And if you're tracking on, my, on, on the talk notes that I provided for you. The problem with being transformed is because we haven't been honest with ourselves. And, and when we just let God transform certain parts of our lives. But we don't let God transform our whole person. And there's some things in our life that are known as character defects. And that's my wife. Not right now. But ask her at the end of the service, say, does your husband have character defects? Does does your husband struggle? Does he have things that he's battling? And she'd be lying if she said no. And friends, I stand up here not as the perfect pastor, but just I'm just trying to share from my heart that if we're honest with ourselves, we all have stuff. Yeah? Yes? We all have these character defects, and there's three Re, there's three reasons that we have character defects. There's three sources that these character defects come from. There's a biological source. There's a sociological source. And there's a theological source. In other words, my chromosomes, write it down. My chromosomes, that's your biological source. My circumstances, that's your sociological source. And finally, your 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 your, your third one, your choices, which is the real biggie, that's your theological source. We talk about chromosomes. This is what you inherited. This is what your mother and father contributed to you. 23,000 chromosomes each. Did you know that? I read it. It boggled my mind. I got 23,000 chromosomes inside of me. No wonder. Life is wacky sometimes. 
23,000 chromosomes from each of your parents inside of you. That's your DNA. That's your biology. That's who you are. That's your makeup. That's your chemical makeup. And you got all these things worn inside of you. And yet we got a lot of good stuff from our parents. But if we're honest, we got some defects from our parents too. Amen? We have a predisposition towards certain problems. And this predisposition doesn't excuse the sins that we make. For instance, because of our parents, we may have tendency to have a hot temper. I'll tell you, I got that one from my father. My father was a military guy. He was in the Navy. He was six foot four. He weighed about 240. And when he spoke, you better listen to what he said because you didn't want him to bust out the paddle from Stucky's, the wood paddle, because he would take that paddle and when he would bust my rear, sometimes he would break that thing and we'd have to make a trip just to see my grandma to the hills of Kentucky so that he can go to another Stucky's and get another one. I, I was raised on on corporal punishment and guess what it didn't hurt me any any it didn't hurt me at all it helped me it was a deterrent (laughs) because when my mom said i'm gonna call your father at work when he was working second shift i knew once that call was made number one he was working second shift i wasn't gonna sleep all night because i was gonna be worried about what he was gonna do to me when i got home and then he'd come home And he'd say, we need to go to your room. No, I don't want to go to my room. Boy, that's what he said. Get in your room. And he'd sit me on the bed. And he would say a little something like this, which I never understood until now. Now, son, I want to just let you know that this is going to hurt me. You lie! You're a liar. (laughs) And he'd spank my butt. But I always remember after he spanked my butt, he would hug me and tell, he said, I love you. And this is for your own good. And I never understood that until now. But it's because sometimes one day I spilled some paint on our garage floor. You could eat off our garage floor. It was so immaculate. You wouldn't, Brother Ken, you wouldn't spill oil on that thing. He had, he had drop cloths and drove the car in there. All the, he had two or three pans under there. It's going to catch every bit of oil. And one day I was messing around and I spilled a whole bucket of paint in there. And he later confessed that this was wrong. But I'm talking about our predisposition. And this isn't funny. I know some of it's been funny. But my friend was over playing basketball. He ripped his belt off and he just tore into me because he had a temper. And later he apologized to me. He called my friend, had my friend come over, told me to call him and apologize to him. But friends, because of that, I struggle with a short fuse. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And we have all things in our life because of our parents. We have a lot of good, but our chromosomes, we wrestle with things. The second thing, sometimes there's things that you inherited that's your chromosomes, but then your circumstances might nurture how I was nurtured, how I was raised. Sometimes our defects come because we have unmet needs. Men have, have needs to, to, to be respected. And, and, and if, if, if you ever do premarital counseling with me, or if you ever want information, there's a wonderful book called Love and Respect out there. And the whole premise of this book is from Scripture and Ephesians, where it says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for. And then it goes on and says, wives respect your husbands. Men want respect. And when men aren't nurtured and when men aren't respected, and I'm talking to the men real quick. This is your free Father's Day uh, message. But but when, when men aren't respected, what do they do? They will try to seek it and to go and grab it. Sometimes by unhealthy ways. And ladies, you want love. You need love. You want nurtured. And when you don't have legitimate needs for love, sometimes you go feel, uh, try to meet that need with things that feel loved, that will make you feel loved. I'm going on a shopping spree because maybe if I have all the nice clothes and maybe if I just look the part and maybe my husband will love me. Are are you with me this morning? We have these unmet needs and we seek ways to feel nurtured to get our needs met. And finally, our choices. That's your theology. Listen to me. If you choose something long enough, 
guess what happens? It becomes a habit. If you do something for 30 days, it becomes a habit. What habits are you choosing? What habits are you producing? And a lot of times, these habits, that's why it's called hurts and habits and hang-ups. Because you build up these habits, and a lot of times our habits are not healthy, and they destroy us. So number two, so that's our, where our character defects come from. Number two, why is it so hard to change them? Why, according to Scripture, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, why is it so hard to be transformed? Number one, because you and I have had these defects so long. We didn't get them overnight. It took years to, to get these defects. And you're not, you didn't get them overnight. You're not going to lose them overnight. The ha- many times the habits and the, the addictions and the struggles that we have, we've developed sometime back during childhood. And we lived with those things and we learned to mask those things. And we've learned to, to, to be a chameleon, if you will, and allow only those things to come out when we're by ourselves or when we're not with somebody. Because if we're with somebody and we bring those things out, then it's going to uh, show the, the, the true person that you and I really are. We've had them for so long. And what happens is um, it's like an old pair of shoes. Maybe they're not the best for running or maybe they're not the best for walking, but they're comfortable, Right. Because we've worn them in. And so these habits become comfortable. And if we tried to do away with these habits, and if we tried to lose these habits, it would put us in an uncomfortable situation. Are you with me this morning? Number two, the second reason it's hard to change them is because we have these identity issues. We confuse our identity with those things. If those things were not a part of our identity, then we would not be who that we are. Have you ever heard the the phrase... It's just who I am. My temper, it's just who I am. My laziness, it's just who I am. My bad decision making, it's just who I am. It's just who I am. I want to encourage you today. And I want you to hear my heart. Number one, it's just not who you are. You don't have to stay there. You might be living there right now, but you don't have to build the tent and stay there. God has given you the power to transform the way that you think and to change who that you are. You don't have to be, you might have been living a bitter life for 42 years, but you don't have to live a bitter life the next 42. Amen? You might be angry for 50 years of your life, but you don't have to live the next 50 angry. I'm trying to help you this morning. You don't, you, you might have been living, and I'm just throwing arbitrary amounts, the, the, the first 17 years of your life that there's young people in here, and you're mad at the world, and you hate the world, and you don't like the way that the world's going. Well, guess what? Decide and let the next 80 years that you live, you be the positive change that you want to see in the world. You don't, and here's, we talk about identity issues. Can I, can I just talk about identity issues for a second? The struggle with myself and the calling that I'm in, a pastor, and many other pastors that I talk to, can, can I tell you that, that, that a lot of times my identity, who I am, becomes who I am as a pastor. And, and that's a struggle for me. You know, if the church is doing good, then I feel good. If the church is not doing good, then I must be some failure or something. And then what happens to me, if I have an identity crisis as a pastor, then guess what? I'm not being the husband that I'm supposed to be. I'm not being the father that I'm supposed to be. And then I'm not being the child of God that I'm supposed to be. Friends, here it is. Your identity is not in all the problems that you have. Your identity is the per- in the perfect person of Jesus Christ who can give you victory and recovery from the problems that you have. Amen? I'm just trying to help us this morning. I don't know. I, I think maybe the reason that I'm preaching this message is because I got all this stuff that I've been wrestling with and all this baggage. And, and God is like, you know, preach to yourself. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I've been wrestling with this. Every week, and I'm like, wow. Here's number three. Why is it hard to change him? Because a lot of times, these are your payoffs. Every defect has a payoff. And and I want to explain to you this. If your defect is your payoff, what what that is is basically that's saying it helps you mask your pain. 
Or it can be an excuse for you to fail. Because you're not, you just fail in life. And you're like, you know what, that, that's fine. The reason I fail is because of my defect. Basically, it helps you to keep failing. Or it helps you to keep making excuses versus changing your identity versus changing this payoff. Let, let me give you an example. Maybe this will help us. A mother says to their kids, kids, come down for dinner. No response. Mother says, kids, come down for dinner. No response. Finally, she yells, kids, come down for dinner. And they come. What is the deal? We set up our mothers to yell. She figures out yelling works. And guess what? There's the payoff. In order to get what she wants, she knows that the payoff or the result will be yelling at the kids to get them to come down for dinner. So the payoff equals the result. Are you, does that make sense today? And so sometimes our defect We live it out as our payoff, and it is unhealthy. And finally, the fourth one, which is probably one of the most important ones this morning, is that Satan discourages me. Can we just be honest? And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but maybe vertical shaking would be okay. Does Satan discourage you? Do you ever wake up in the morning and before your feet hit the floor... Instead of saying, good morning, Lord, you say, Lord, it's morning. And I don't want to get out of bed because Satan is discouraging me. I got this business meeting or I got this family dinner or I got whatever it may be. And I'm discouraged. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. You know what his job is? It's to accuse you. It's to discourage you. It's to tell you how good you're not being or acting. Would you turn to Revelation? Just turn to that, Revelation 12. I just want to read this because I think this, maybe this will strengthen you and encourage you. And I'm trying to move quickly today. Revelation chapter 12 Verse 7 says this. And war broke out in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought. With who? The dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not. Who's they? The the dragon and his angels. That's who they is. They did not prevail. nor, Nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the entire world. And we keep reading, he was cast to the earth. Watch this, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ have come. And here's, this is why we said Satan is the accuser of brethren. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. Friends, this morning, I don't care how Satan is discouraging you. I don't care how much Satan is telling you're not good enough. The Bible says that you and I can be overcomers and that you and I can live in victory. You and I don't have to live like that anymore. Why? Because Because the blood of the Lamb, Christ Jesus, has overcome. So today, you can make make up in your mind that you will recover. Turn to your neighbor and say, you will recover. And mean it. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know about you. No, say, you will recover. Why? Because you have the power of the living Christ Jesus inside of you. Satan can try to lie about you and lie on you and tell you how good you're not. But guess what? You can come back and say, yes, I am, because I'm made in his image. I might not be looking too good to you right now, devil, but just hold on. (laughs) Hold on. Because joy comes in the morning. (laughs) I may look like midnight right now. I may look like death warmed over right now. But pretty soon I'm going to be infused with the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to have power. (laughs) I'm going to start to preach now. He discourages us. He says, if you try to get rid of this, you're going to go crazy. Well, I got the word for you. If you don't get rid of this, you're going to go crazy. 
So pick which crazy you want. <laughs> Be crazy for Jesus. Finally, number three, how do I cooperate with God's change process? And I go, remember back to our scripture, be transformed. Say transform. One of my favorite uh, movies, series. You know, I just want to, this is just, this is not really biblical or anything like that. But I just want to give this to you. This is just my, my observation my movie-going observation, my movie-going critiques. They can't make a good movie anymore. they got to just keep duplicating all the stuff they used to make. It's like all these comic books are coming back, and it's like, like 58 of this and that. But one of my favorite ones, was a, it was a comic book when I was growing up, it was the Transformers. I love Transformers. I had to try, I had to, when I, I remember the one, it was an airplane, I had this airplane, do, 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 do. one day it's a plane, and then I transformed into a robot, but I love the movie Transformers, can't wait for the new one to come out, anybody want to take me, no, but, but here's the thing, they're in disguise, they just look like the world, look like everything in the world, oh, I'm going to get somewhere in a second. But then something happens and they transform and they become something that's not of this world. Friends, the Bible says that you and I are in the world, but we're not of it. We're to be transformed into something from another world. (laughs) You don't have to be like everybody else. Yeah, you're in the body, in the shell, in the skin or in the clothes. You might look like everybody else, but you're from another world. You're an alien in this world. You're a stranger. You don't belong here. Yes, you live here, but soon you're going to go to another home, Beulah land. Amen. But in order to get there, you've got to be transformed. That's why the slogan of the Transformers, Transformers more than meets the eye. And friends, there's got to be more to you than meets the eye. There's got to be a depth inside of you. And it just has to be not just knowledge, but you have to have transformation. Oh, I feel it today. Do not be conformed. Don't be like everybody else. Don't have to be like every other church. Don't have to be like every preacher. I love T.D. Jakes, but I don't have to be him. I love Rod Parsley, but I don't have to be him. I got to be the best version of me that I can be. Be transformed. You got to change the way that you think. How do we do that? Let me give you seven ways real quick. Before, here's why you have to do that. Here's why. I've, 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 I've driven a boat like twice in my life. And, and I don't know, Brother Jimmy, do boats have autopilot? Do they do something you can set? And just They don't, do they? See, that's why I don't drive them. Not sure. <laughs> we need to get you another boat then. I want you to imagine with me. Let's just imagine with me. That boats had autopilot, all right? You can have your autopilot in your boat going west. And you can be okay with that. But then somebody texts you and said, man, you got to get over here. The fish are biting really. But you, but you haven't taken off that autopilot. And you need to go east. You can fight that thing. You can try to turn that boat around. And you can probably get there. But eventually, by the time you get to where your buddy is, you're going to be worn plumb out. Because you've been fighting that thing. Are you, are you tracking with me? Crazy illustration. And you're not going to have strength enough to... I'm not even doing it right, am I? See, I, I, see you guys got to take me. And As my aunt said in Kentucky, you got to learn me how to do it. But see, that's why I'm not a good fisherman, because I don't have patience to... I'm not, let's see. Whatever, you get my point. <laughs> I just want to throw it out there, and I want immediacy. This, I want to stick a dynamite. That's me. I want to blow something up. I want to throw it in the water, and then all of a sudden, boom, and there's a fish come rising to the top. Now, scoop them out. That's a good day for me. Praise God. <laughs> Take me on a fishing show. Dynamite Fishing by Pastor Gary. 
But, but here's the thing. We live our lives in autopilot because we're conformed to the world. And when God wants to redirect us somewhere else, guess what? We are staying in autopilot and we're trying to correct ourselves. And autopilot, the devil and the world and all this stuff that's pulling culture. Then why the time we get tired and we get worn out and we're just like, I just give up. Let me give you seven ways to help to transform you and to help to change you. I'm going to fly through these really quick, so put your seatbelt on. Number one, focus on changing. Say one. One. Come on, say one. One. Friends, you might have 30. You might have 10. Can I just, let me just encourage you today. When you get victory over something, you're going to find that something else is on the horizon that needs victory. Let me that. You're like, hallelujah, woohoo, I got victory. Guess what? Something else is going to come your way. You get victory over one defect, here comes another one. Change one thing at a time. Don't try to change the 30. I love basketball. There was some games when I played basketball in elementary and high school and college that, that we were getting blown out, and it was bad. And we go to halftime, and the coach starts throwing stuff. Sitting there eating oranges, he grips oranges out of our hands, starts throwing it up against the wall and explodes everywhere. And he's like, what are you guys doing? Beep, 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 blank, 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 blank. I can't say what he really said. We're videoing, so I can't say. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But then he would finally say, one offensive possession at a time and one defensive possession at a time. You can't get 25 points back one time down the court. It's not like MTV All-Star Game where you have a 25-point circle at half court, you know? You got to get one point back at a time. One defensive stop back at a time. And friends, that's how our Christian life is. I I love the hymn. I I I wish I could just go up on the piano and just start playing hymns and just start singing. Because then I'd sing something like this. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. One day at a time. That's all he's asking from you. And he's not even asking for one day. He's asking for one second. One minute. One hour. And one day. Focus. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24, an intelligent person aims at a wise action. What's the wise action? Changing one thing at a time. But a fool starts off in many directions. Friends, what's that one thing you need to change? Write it down. And then number two, kind of along with that, focus on one victory, one day at a time. Focus on a victory, one day at a time. Matthew 6, 11 says, give us this month our daily bread. Hold on a second. Some of y'all are like, should I say something or should I not? It doesn't say give us one month. It says, give us what? This day. And then Matthew 6, 33, uh, verse 34, two scriptures that you need to put in your database. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 34. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Friends, don't worry about what you're going to do tomorrow. Tomorrow's tomorrow. Worry about today. And even when we come to church, don't worry about where you want to go eat physically because right now you're getting spiritual food and if you're worried about the physical food you're missing out on the spiritual food that God has for you amen one day at a time one change at a time one victory at a time you ever heard the old saying how do you how do you eat an elephant how how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time you don't go oh lord you know so one, just, just, cut, just, just cut a little bit off. Stuff your face. And do it again. And eventually, over time. Right? Some of us see food and we're like, oh, Lord, ah, I'm not going to have it. No, just enjoy it, man. I take, whenever you go out to eat with me, I take forever to eat. Because I like talking. I don't want to hear it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no amen right there. No, I just want to enjoy it. Are you with me? And friends, we got to enjoy the journey, right? Victory. Number three, we have to focus 
on God's power, not our own willpower. We already know willpower isn't, isn't enough because if willpower was enough, you'd already stop the habit that you've already been in, right? If, if willpower was enough, you could have already handled it. You could have already nixed it. You could have already dealt with it. But friends, willpower is not enough. We need a higher power. And some of y'all are like, why, why did you just say you need a higher power? Friends, and we can, we can bag on AA and we can bag on all this 12 steps and all this stuff they want, but it was a Christian-based thing and their higher power is God. And for some of those people that go through that, they haven't had a realization that God is God. And, and so for them going through it, eventually they get there and they understand who the higher power is. We just got to jump on it, right? Because we grew up in church, we know the higher power is God, Right? So we need a power that's bigger than us. We need God's power. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 23. This is a pretty awesome text. Watch this. Focus on God's power, not willpower. Jeremiah 12, 23 says, Can a leopard... You know, there's some interesting things in Scripture. It says, Can a leopard change his spots? And it says, Nor can you, who are used to doing evil, start being good. That's, that's pretty awesome, huh? Can a leopard change his spots? Nor do, do, do I or do you that's used to doing, can you just automatically? No, you can't. Why? You've got to focus on God's power, not your own. And then Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 says, I can, I love this, this version. It says, I can master anything. You know it as I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But it says, I can master anything with the help of Christ. You know why you can? I, I read this analogy this week. It's a really great analogy. I, I want you to think about that one thing that you're struggling with or that one thing that you need victory over. And, and I want you to imagine taking that one thing and walking it out, whether it's your temper or whether it's an addiction, whether it's an attitude, whatever you're working on for, first, and, and you take that thing out and you open a garbage can. Then you open that garbage can and you throw that thing in there. Just follow with me for a second. And you throw that thing in the garbage can, then you put the lid on the garbage can, and then you take it out to the front of your house. And then there's a garbage truck that comes up. And it doesn't say Herringshaw Waste Management or the city of Muskogee, but it says God and Son doing business with people like you for over 2,000 years. And then Jesus sends some of his buddies out of the garbage truck. It says doing business with you for over 2,000 years. And the buddy of Jesus comes out and he picks up that garbage can with that stuff that you already put in there and he takes it and he dumps it. And he puts you back in an empty garbage can. And this is what God does for us in our daily lives. And guess what he does? Then that garbage can dries off with your mess. And the Bible says he buries it in the sea of forgetfulness. It's a dump yard that you don't have to see that mess any longer. It's not going to be brought up to you anymore. Why? Because you're focusing on God's power, not your willpower. Number four, focus on what God wants, not what you want. See, we want to hold on to that. We want to see the Bible says, uh, Philippians 4, 8. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is good, what is right. Think about things that are pure. Think about all you can praise God for and be glad about. We need to focus on the good things and not the bad things. Are you with me this morning? Stop walking around and talking about, oh, I'm just a sorry sinner. I'm just a nobody. Friends, you are somebody. God can take anybody who thinks they're a nobody and he can turn them into somebody. If he can save me, he can save you. If he saved you, he can save your friend. If he saved your friend, he can save your friend's friend. Amen? Are you, are, you, are you with me this morning? Fix your eyes on what God wants. Stop resisting what, what God wants in your life. James chapter 4, verse 7. Notice it says, James 4, 7 says, Resist the devil and he will flee. Here's the problem in our lives. Many of us are trying to resist that thing that we need changed. We're, you know, we're trying to resist that temptation. We're trying to resist that addiction. But nowhere in the Bible does it says resist your temptation and it will end. Have you ever thought about that? It says resist the devil who's the one who brings the temptation and it will, 
he will flee. Are you with me this morning? So focus on what God wants, not what you want. Number five, focus on doing good, not being good. Galatians 5.16 says, if you're led by the Spirit, you will not be led and, and do what the flesh wants it to do. If you do the right thing, eventually your feelings will catch up with you. So, so you say, I don't feel like it. Well, guess what? You've tried it long enough. And it hasn't worked for you this long. So, so can, can I just ask you to try something different? Would you just do something different? You've tried it your way long enough. Would you try God's way? And sometimes, eventually doing the right thing, even when you don't feel like it, eventually will become the right thing that you start to feel like doing. Does that make sense? Let me give you these last two. This, this, this one is huge. And it, we, we started to talk about this last week. We talked about telling somebody about your moral inventory that you've taken. Number six, focus on people that help you, not people that hinder you. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, write that down. Bad company corrupts good character. In other words, if you don't want to get stung, stay away from the bees. Huh? Are you, are you with me this morning? You, you know, uh, there, there's a guy in the, in the, in the, in the, in the safari, an African safari, People, people, and this is very sad and it's very, tra- very tragic and, and it's a true story. They were mourning the guy's uh, death at the hands. He, he'd been eaten by a lion. But he made a choice to go out and to put himself right in front of the lions thinking that he had some power over them, some ma- magical power and he could talk to them and walk with them and do all this stuff. True story has spiritual implications. If we go right out in the middle of the devil's tricks and the devil's schemes, thinking that we can handle it, we're going to get eaten every time. For the Bible says that Satan walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Friends, spiritually, he will devour you. Amen? He will eat you. And friends, if you start to hang out with the wrong people, if you continue to hang out with the wrong people, friends, guess what? Eventually you're going to get eaten. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharp sharpens iron so people can improve each other. Hang out with people. That will elevate you. And I put this on our, our Facebook a couple days ago. The, the, there's an old saying, and you guys know it, birds of a feather flock together. But did you know that there's two different types of flocks? There's flocks that will elevate you and lift you up. And there's people that will lift you up and encourage you. But there's other people that will bring you down to their level. And sometimes it's hard to cut the cord. Sometimes it's hard to to cut off that relationship. But if they're bringing you down, you ought not to be around them. And you say, well, I'm just bringing Jesus to them. Well, if they're bringing hell to you and devil to you and you're succumbing to it, maybe you're not really bringing Jesus to them like you think that you should. Maybe you need to get stronger. Amen? Number seven, the last one. Focus on progress, not perfection. You say, Pastor, I've been, I've been doing this. I've been, I've been hanging with you. I've been doing this series with you. It's been four weeks and I, and I haven't recovered yet. It's not going to be four weeks. It's not even going to be eight weeks when this series is over. Friends, we are to be lifelong students and, 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 and followers of Christ. Disciple. No, notice the word discipleship. What's a ship do? It takes a while to get from one destination to the other. Friends, guess what? Discipleship. Living a transformative life. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes you've got to ferment a little bit. Are you with me this morning? Sometimes you just got to sit there and you've got to settle and you let, let God do the firm, fermentation. The, the Bible says that, that, that God is the potter and that we are the clay. Sometimes after God works on us a little bit, we've got to sit on the shelf for a while. And we've got to harden up <laughs> to be what God has intended us to be. Focus on the progress not your perfection. Because see, and we told, we've been talking about this on Wednesday nights. Your perfection, according to Paul, is not like you've you got you to do everything perfect. That's not, that's not what he's talking about. See, here's the thing. We've got to focus on our progress and not perfection. Because here's the thing. The world likes quick stuff. What? Instant potatoes. Microwave popcorn. Instant coffee. I don't, 
Coffee's terrible. I can't like instant or anyways. God bless you for those that drink it. We want instant maturity. We want instant perfection. We want one day I'm a total mess, then the next day I'm Billy Graham. No. Billy Graham didn't become Billy Graham overnight. Billy Graham's Billy Graham because he's been trying to be like Christ for 95 years of his life. And that's why Billy Graham is Billy Graham. Are you with me this morning? Would you stand every head bowed, every eye closed?